Eugenie Sage. Mr Speaker, it's interesting that the Minister said he was looking forward to a genuine process of engagement and dialogue. Would have been very pleased to have been standing in the House to support this bill if there had been that genuine process, if there had been an exposure draft, as at one stage with the uh, great conflict around the changes to part two, the Prime Minister, I think, suggested that there be a draft that go out to the public. But instead, we've had it dropped in the House with less than a week, well, for a week, uh, for the opposition to actually review it. We've had one law firm this week describe the bill as one of the most fundamental changes to the Resource Management Act since it was passed in 1991. And that's because it's not just changing the RMA, it's also changing the uh, Exclusive Economic Zone Legislation, Conservation Act and the Reserves Act. We could have supported it if it had been about uh, reform for improvements in our environmental management. And there are certainly aspects in the bill that we do support. One of those is adding the management of natural hazards to the list of matters of importance in Section C, Section 6, to elevate this. But we do note that there has long been a power to issue national policy statements, and the government has declined to provide that clear national guidance in relation to one of the biggest natural hazards that we are facing, sea level rise as a result of climate change. The government's objected to providing that direction, even though there have been calls from Local Government New Zealand, the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment and others to provide guidance to local authorities on how they deal with sea level rise, how they make the hard decisions around planning and managing uh, that. We support the provisions for national planning templates, but would point out that this is a quarter of a century too late. It would have been much better to have had those templates when the Act was introduced in, and passed in 1991 uh, in terms of providing that, that consistency. <coughs> we support things like the uh, better engagement processes for uh, iwi authorities, the online filing provisions, bringing um, those filing processes into the 21st century. But we are opposing the bill because there are a number of um, provisions in it which undermine the public's ability to engage in decision makings about how the environment in their area should occur and because of a number of provisions which actually uh, weaken environmental safeguards and compromise the ability of councils to regulate. We're opposing the bill because a lot of the changes appear to be driven by ideology rather than robust analysis and evidence. And as Treasury's regulatory impact assessment team says, there has been no consultation on some of the most significant components of the reform package. And if I could quote, this means there is little evidence as to how stakeholders are likely to respond to new incentives and opportunities. It is therefore unclear how far the reform package is likely to deliver its objective of robust and durable resource management decisions. That uh, regulatory impact assessment several times notes the absence of empirical evidence to justify the proposals in the bill. It notes that the benefits and the costs of each option aren't systematically weighed and therefore it's difficult to determine whether the most suitable uh, changes have been um, proposed. So when you haven't got that evidence, when the changes seem driven by ideology, we are suspicious. We, we believe that it's much more than tinkering um, and that it is making some quite significant changes which will continue to centralise power with the Minister and significantly increase his power at the expense of local authority and their ability to represent and consult their communities on how they as councils develop the planning framework for their regions and districts, how they develop the policies and the rules which determine how air, coast, land, rivers, groundwater are managed, what sort of environmental effects are acceptable when uh, use and development happens and what sort of effects are unacceptable. And that's because this bill significantly increases the regulation making powers of the minister and uh, centralises environmental management. 
And that's been a hallmark of this government, giving more power to ministers at the expense of local councils. It's giving the minister the power to make regulations to permit certain land use activities. Well, what will those activities be? How arbitrary will those decisions be? It gives the minister and the executive the power to uh, um, uh, impose um, changes where councils have uh, maybe imposed unnecessary restrictions on residential development. So those sort of powers are quite arbitrary and they will cut across the ability of councils to consult and represent uh, their communities. They're also going to be potentially ad hoc, which cuts across the stated desire of more national consistency because the regulation making powers may only apply to certain districts or regions. They don't have to apply across the country. We're opposing the bill because it restricts the ability for the public to get involved in key resource management decisions. Not only does the bill narrow the scope of submissions on resource consents, but it's also reducing the ability of the public to have input on plan changes which change the policy provisions which govern environmental management. And that's going to limit the ability to make submissions to affected parties. Those affected parties are generally considered to be landholders. That means it undermines the ability of community organisations, environmental organisations to have standing in front of councils to make submissions and promote the community interest in the changes that they seek. We oppose it because we think there'll be much less accountability in the way in which councils develop and make decisions on district and regional plans through this new streamlined plan making process which the bill provides for. In this process, there is no ability for submitters to front up to a hearing panel to present further evidence to the hearing panel and to see who is actually making the decisions on the plan. That whole hearing process doesn't exist in the fast track um, plan making process. And potentially, um, <coughs> excuse me, it also means that there's the opportunity there for the minister and the council to agree on this fast track process um, if there's a, a sort of a convenient interest there and to shut out um, the public from uh, being involved in hearings. And in Christchurch, where we've had CERA developing plans without a hearing process, we've had faceless decision makers making critical decisions behind closed doors. The bill provides for collaborative planning processes. That is something that the Green Party has supported, but there increasingly are problems with collaborative processes. In Canterbury, with the water management strategy and the 10 zone committees, environmental organisations have walked away from that because they see the zone committees as increasingly dominated by agribusiness and irrigation interests. In the McKenzie Forum, the collaborative process which was supposed to decide the future of the high country has virtually collapsed. Fish and Game has recently left the National Land and Water Forum. So those collaborative processes which showed so much promise don't seem to be um, delivering on that. We oppose the legislation because of the politicisation of decision making under the EEZ. There the government has caved into lobbying by the petroleum industry and seabed miners. And it's having the minister appoint the uh, decision making panels for applications for marine consents in the EEZ when officials advise that it should be uh, the EPA that continues to do that and the RMA should be made consistent with the EPA. So that is politicising decision making in the EEZ. It's giving the minister too much power and it's very uh, pertinent that the only people that MFE consulted with with PPANS, the Petroleum um, Exploration and Production Association, and uh, mining uh, interests. It didn't consult with community organisations to make that change. Once again, it shows that this government is captured by corporate interests. It is not passing these changes to benefit all of New Zealanders, to um, ensure that we have protection that safeguards the places that Kiwis love. It's making changes to our environmental law to benefit special interests who are interested in exploitation rather than protection. So there's been absolutely no public consultation on that. And it's being shunted through that change because the EEZ legislation has only been enforced since uh, 2013. Now, Mr Speaker, others have seen 
the fact that this bill doesn't make those changes that were initially proposed to uh, part two, pancaking the matters of national importance to becoming a grab bag of matters, stripping out things like um, recognition of amenity values, intrinsic values, uh, the quality of the environment, is a major victory. It is certainly a victory, and we thank the Māori Party and uh, the Honourable Peter Dunn for their advocacy there. We shouldn't have even been having that debate about stripping out those environmental safeguards. It shows how much of an attack this government has made or wanted to make uh, on the RMA. The environmental safeguards in the bill should be strengthened. The government has missed the opportunity in terms of improving the prospects for our indigenous biodiversity by strengthening private property rights in this bill, by having a chilling effect on councils and their ability to regulate, by allowing the Environment Court potentially to require councils I'm sorry to, to interrupt the member, but her time has expired.